On this episode of MRI Physics Explained, the time is finally here. We're going to start our journey explaining K-Space, and it begins by questioning the very nature of all we've been taught so far. We're going to pay dues to those that came before us, unveil the roadmap to how we're going to explain such a complex subject such as K-Space, and to give you the chance to escape the MRI physics simulation. Will you choose to take the red pill? Hello everyone and welcome. Dr. T.E. here, along with Tim Kerrigan, MD. I want to first thank you all for your support for this channel. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear from you all and see your enthusiasm on an otherwise quite boring subject. We're going to do something truly special in this next lecture series titled, How It Really Works. We're going to explain K-Space and image building and in the process turn most of what you thought you knew about MRI physics on its head. It's not going to be easy, but as always, we're going to try to lay it out in a logical, visual-heavy fashion. But before we begin, I want to take a second and acknowledge someone incredibly special in the MRI physics world. If you've ever searched for an MRI physics question online, you've probably been led to MRIquestions.com. This is, in my opinion, the Bible for MRI physics. Before we had these fancy videos, Dr. Elster brought MRI education to the masses with his intuitive explanations and graphics, as well as source papers for us all to consume. Even more remarkable, you'll see no ads on his site, no gimmicky courses, he's kept it free and open to all, and my promise to you is that my content will follow in his example and always be free and open. This channel would not exist if it weren't for him and the incredible site he's built, so please go donate to his site if you find these lectures and his own material helpful. With that, let's begin. I want you to think about the lectures you've seen so far. The initial core lectures covered nuclear magnetic resonance, how we generate a signal, how we localize a signal to build an image, and what phenomena and parameters govern image contrast. If you haven't seen them yet, I highly recommend viewing them before proceeding with these more advanced lectures. The question I have for you is, did we say or do anything radical here? Did what we cover vary substantially from the prior MRI physics education you've experienced? Did we more or less follow the same treaded path of topics but filling in the gaps along the way? Now let me ask you this, how do you feel about it? Is it all crystal clear? No more questions? Or does something still feel a little off when you consider what we learned and what you experience daily in the field? Maybe it's readily apparent. You could shout out, aha, we haven't discussed this yet. Or maybe it's more subtle, an uneasy feeling you have deep down that something is missing, that the dots just don't connect with reality, and that there must be a deeper truth hidden in all this technical jargon. Are we forever bound by frequency and phase encoding gradients? Or is it possible that we may be living in an MRI physics education simulation? Are you ready to take the red pill? So first, let's breathe a sigh of relief knowing that not all you've learned is false. This initial lecture on nuclear magnetic resonance, where we discussed how we generate and capture a signal, is true. No tricks here, this is how it works. Also, the long lecture series on the echo and the many different pulse sequences we employ is also true. So let's turn our attention to the crux of the matter. There is one major topic you have all likely heard about and which we haven't discussed yet. Say it with me now, K-Space. At no point in this lecture series do we talk about K-Space, but it's brought up in almost every other MRI physics lecture course. Why? Now we did cover how to create an image in lectures 2, 3, and 4 using all the traditionally taught topics. We first apply a slice select gradient and RF pulse to energize the slice of the body and generate a signal. We then apply a frequency encoding gradient either across the X or Y axis to encode spatial information by frequency along that axis. And finally, we shift the phase along the other axis. Then using something called a Fourier transform, 
and a little math, we're able to localize the signal strength coming from each voxel within our slice to build our contrasted picture. This is the one minute version of a very complex process, but these lectures are in the link above if you need a refresher. So if these are truly the steps we need to generate a picture, why do we need this concept of case space at all? In fact, if we were to suddenly introduce this subject now, it would feel confusing and out of place. Wouldn't you agree? So this is our first hint in the MRI physics simulation we've all been trapped in. What about case space? There's another extremely unsettling concept when it comes to case space. As most of you have heard during any talk about case space, it's where we go from the time domain to frequency space, and we produce this picture. Here you go, frequency space. But let's hold on a second. We see this interesting looking image and are telling you time disappears, we are now in frequency space. In what scenario in life have you ever experienced time disappearing? What happened to time? Does our MRI machine ever freeze in time or escape the passage of time while we're capturing an image? So in addition to the general question of what about K-Space, we also have the question of what happens to time when we talk about K-Space. Where did it go? For the next hint, let's now dig a little deeper into this phase encoding lecture. Specifically, we laid out a mathematical relationship between the amount of phase shift we induced across the phase encoding direction, in this example along the y-axis, and how it affects the raw MRI signal we record. In our example in Lecture 4, we used very simplistic phase shifts of zero, completely in-phase T2 decay curves, and 180 degrees out of phase decay curves. In the in phase scenario, we knew the individual T2 decay curves in each voxel would add together to form our raw signal. And in the scenario with a 180 degree phase shift between the voxels, we knew they would subtract from one another. This allowed us to create these two independent equations, which we could solve for to place the measured value within each voxel. But we warned you that this was oversimplistic, so let's talk about that. According to traditional MRI physics courses, for every voxel in the phase encoding direction, we need to apply a unique phase shift to solve these equations. In this simple 2x2 two two voxel example, we would need two unique phase encoding gradients in the formulas we just showed. In a 3x3 three three voxel slice, we would need three unique phase encoding gradients, and so on. But we all know that real MRI images contain way more voxels than this. In fact, some standard image matrix sizes are 128 by 256 voxels, 256 by 256, or even 512 by 512 voxels, and this brings up the question. How would we know what the equations would be for hundreds of phase shifts required in a real image? we're no longer dealing with simple addition and subtraction. Even in the simplest case, a 128 by 256 image matrix, we would need at minimum 128 unique phase shifts and equations to solve for. Even if we could accurately induce such phase shifts for so many voxels, how could we possibly know where one part adds and another subtracts? We certainly wouldn't get one unique solution to these equations that we knew with relative confidence reflected the true contrast of the picture. So hint number two. We have problems with this signal localization theory. It quickly falls apart when trying to expand it to a real life image. This brings us to our last clue that we may be living in an MRI physics simulation. Going back to this pesky notion of phase encoding, we played along with the commonly taught idea that we need a unique phase encoding gradient for every row or column of voxels in our slice, depending on which axis we choose. If it's a 2x2 two two voxel slice, like in our simplest example, we needed two unique phase encoding gradients. If it's a 3x3 three three voxel slice, we'd need three. 
And if it's a real image, like this standard 128 by 256 voxel slice, we could potentially need up to 256 unique phase encoding gradients depending on which axis we chose. This all stemmed from the image building theory we just covered, and is so ingrained into the current educational landscape that we even made it a major part of this formula regarding imaging time that is commonly tested on exams. But we also talked about techniques we use to reduce imaging time in our pulse sequence lecture series. We covered the fast spin echo in lecture 10, and then went even more extreme with the ultra fast spin echo in lecture 11, one of which was called the haste sequence. But what does haste stand for? Half Fourier Acquisition Single Shot Turbo Spin Echo. I know it's a mouthful, but the important part here is half Fourier acquisition. According to the rules of phase encoding and picture building we just covered, how can we acquire only half of the needed data to build a picture and still produce a picture? What should a picture look like if we tried this using the old school teachings? At best, we'd get something like this, right? we wouldn't be able to fully resolve all the voxels within the image along the phase encoding direction. In theory, if we only acquired half the data, we would only be able to generate half the image at best. But is this what our true haste image looks like? No, it looks like a normal, fully formed image. How can this possibly be given what we've been taught about phase encoding and image building? So our third and final hint that we're living in an MRI physics simulation is revealed by examining the haste sequence. How can we build a picture with incomplete data? I hope you can now see we have some major flaws in our theory and there's no easy way to put this. You have been lied to. By most MRI physics courses, even by me. All those times you sat through a lecture trying to understand these encoding gradients and k-space and feeling like the dots just don't connect it's because they don't. Your gut feeling was correct. You should listen to it more often. This is part of the reason why no matter how hard you try, K-space doesn't make sense. It is incompatible with the way MRI physics is taught. Now you may ask why. Why would these false ideas be perpetuated over and over again by presumably very smart people? And I can't claim to know the answer to this, but I personally don't think it is done maliciously. I think everyone is struggling with the most common problem of all MRI physics. How can we teach such a challenging subject to everyone no matter their educational background? The reality is, most people using this technology don't have advanced engineering and physics degrees, and we must try and find something close enough to the truth but still digestible for all. Some might say we don't even do a good job at that. The difficulty of this subject cannot be overstated. But as you know, we like a challenge on this channel, and I believe you should know the truth, if you can handle it. It'll require getting into some advanced math and concepts, but we will try to continue to maintain our focus on the overall picture and attempt to make this accessible to all. So let's get started. In order to figure out what's really going on here, we need to understand four critical topics. The Fourier transform, the MRI equation, k-space, and building an image. To add to the challenge, these topics are not related in a linear fashion. One does not lead to the other, leading to the next, until we reach the final concept. It's way more diabolical than that. The topics are circular in nature, and need to be understood simultaneously together. There's no beginning point in this cycle. If you follow it long enough, you'll end up right back where you started. But we have to begin this journey somewhere, so without further ado, on the next episode of MRI Physics Explained, Brad Pitt? M and M? What the f do they have to do with MRI Physics? Well, the answer to these questions and more await you in a lecture exploring Fourier things. If you enjoy these videos, consider liking and commenting, following us on social media, hit the join button to see ways you can support us further, and click that subscribe button below. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. This is Dr. T.E. for Tim Kerrigan, MD, signing off.